Hello, my name is Elliot in the SCA. I go by Elias de Burton. Uh, I portray a mid 14th century forester in Cheshire, England. In the current Middle Ages, I'm a forester in the Kingdom of Atlantia Royal Forestry Guild. 
and I'm going to talk to you today about some of the gear I use when I go medieval camping. Now, I hesitated a little bit there, and that's because medieval camping wasn't something that people did, at least not by choice. But it's a lot of fun to get out in the woods with your gear and your kit and to try to figure out how things might have been done with some old-fashioned equipment. I'm going to be framing my talk today using the five C's of survivability. Now, this was a mnemonic device popularized by Dave Canterbury, and the five C's of survivability are cover, combustion, cordage, cutting tools, and containers. And containers I'm going to divide up into cook pots and canteens. So cover is anything that protects you from the element. Now, a lot of folks don't think about it, but your first layer of cover, your first protection against the elements, is actually the clothing you're wearing. Uh, depending on what sort of reenacting circles you move in, you may hear historic clothing referred to as soft kit or garb. And so in this case, my soft kit is based heavily on the Boxton man's clothing. So I've got a wool hood, a wool tunic, and wool hosen. Under that, I've got linen, uh, linen under tunic and linen braids. So that's my first layer of protection. So the second layer of protection I've got is this tarp you see here. Now, this is an oilcloth tarp made with a high linen content fabric. I didn't spring for 100% linen because I was afraid I was going to mess it up. Uh, so this is, I think, about 80-20 linen and cotton blended together. So for my 14th century forester, this is probably inaccurate. Uh, oil cloth seems to have become very popular in the 18th century. It most likely existed before that, but I certainly can't date it to the 14th century. And most images of tarps that I see, or references to tarps in uh, documents, they seem to have been used when they were used, and they probably weren't used by foresters, they seem to have been used uh, by more than one person. These single man tarps that are really popular in the bushcraft community nowadays just don't seem to have been used uh, before modern bushcrafting. The next layer of cover I'm going to talk about is my bedroll here. Remove this. This is a cutting tool. We're not there yet. We'll come back to that. So this is my bedroll. This has my blankets, some spare clothing, um, and a couple other items wrapped up in my oil cloth uh, ground cloth. So this is going to protect me from the moisture in the ground. So the blanket I'm using is a Hudson Bay six-point blanket. That means it's roughly a queen size. Uh, it's a fairly substantial blanket. I will typically only carry this when it gets cold in milder weather. I will uh, carry a smaller wool, uh, about a twin size, uh, Israeli military surplus blanket. So what you can see in the middle here is primarily some spare clothing. So I've got a knit hat for when it gets uh, cold and I sleep. Now this is not terribly authentic to my period, but it was relatively inexpensive. It's 100% wool and I like the uh, pattern. Inside, these are definitely not appropriate for the 14th century. This is a pair of wool fingerless knit gloves. I like to have these around because they leave my fingers free. And that lets me do what I need to do and it still keeps everything warm. I can even layer these under these leather and wool mittens. There's just enough room that I can actually pull them on with my fingerless mittens still on. So if it's real cold, I can have my gloves on. If I need to do something that requires a little bit more dexterity, I can pull off the mitten and still have something to keep my hands a little bit warm. These are some additional items that really aren't appropriate for the 14th century, but my toes get cold. So we've got some 18th century style wool stockings that I can wear under my hosen. 
and a pair of very thick felted type wool uh, booties is what I've been calling them, almost like slippers. And these are some spare clothes that I keep in my bedroll. I've got a change of linens in case I get sweaty during the day so I can change them to sleep in. And this is a buttoned wool coat hardy that can actually go under this gray tunic that I'm wearing for if it gets really cold. So the next thing I want to talk about is cutting tool. I carry a small belt knife, a larger knife uh, of an earlier sort of Norse style, and a belt axe. And this is a, a more 18th century style belt axe, so neither the large camp knife nor the belt axe are appropriate for my 14th century uh, interpretation. Um, but one was a gift, and this one, it was inexpensive enough that I could give it a try and see if I liked the weight and the size without committing a whole lot of money. For cordage, I tend to use a lot of hemp cord and leather lacing, like what you see holding my tarp up here. No paracord, unfortunately. So for combustion, fire making, I use flint and steel. So this is my tinder bag, tied closed with a piece of jute that I can pull apart to help me make a fire if I need to. Inside I've got some other tinder materials. I've got a box of char cloth with a spare flint and steel. I've got my flint. And I've got my favorite striker. Now, char cloth, certainly not modern char cloth, was probably not used in the 14th century, but it's super handy and easy to carry and reliable when starting a fire with flint and steel. So our last C is containers. Like I said, I'm dividing that up into cook pots and canteens. So I've got two cook pots here. My more authentic cook pot is this ceramic pipkin. So this is a stoneware uh, pot. You can see it's gotten a lot of use. And so this holds uh, about five cups. So this is great for a group trek, especially if you can have someone carry a tarp someone carry an axe, someone carry a cook pot like this, you can divide up your gear and share. Uh, like I said, it's authentic. It's also quite heavy. <coughs> Another cook pot I have that isn't authentic really to any time period is this uh, copper corn boiler or bean boiler is what they get called. This one's from Backwoods Tin and Copper. And this holds about two cups. It's great for solo treks. It's light. Um, but it really isn't authentic to any period. These used to be used by 18th century style trekkers, but they really aren't even authentic to the 18th century, so they've fallen out of favor lately. And for canteens, this is my costrel. This is a leather canteen. It's called Jackware, um, and it's made out of three pieces of leather and sealed with resin and beeswax. There's a few pieces of gear that I've brought with me that I haven't talked about yet. Uh, one, maybe the elephant in the room, is my eyeglasses. So these are modeled after mid 18th century eyeglasses. They, I feel like, call a little bit less attention to themselves than my modern plastic giant hipster glasses, uh, but they really aren't any less wrong for the 14th century than my modern glasses. And so I wear these because I'm blind as a bat without them. If I'm at an event where I have access to running water and I can wash my hands, I'll wear contacts. But out in the woods, I don't want to mess with that. Another piece of gear I haven't talked about is my modern safety gear. This is my first aid kit. This has got some modern fire starting supplies, space blanket, things like that. So I wanted it to not stand out too much with my gear, which is why it's made of wool. It's got leather straps. 
but I want it to be easy to find, that's why it's red, and I want it to be get easy to get into, so it has these uh, button studs that you can just uh, unhook quite easily to get into the bag if you need to. Hopefully you don't need to. I also carry some eating utensils, sometimes I get called feast gear. Got a wooden bowl, wooden spoon, has a notch carved into it so I can use it as a pot lid lifter. And then a small ceramic mug. I like this mug because the form is not terribly off for the 14th century, and it also holds exactly a cup so I can use it to measure out food and water when I'm cooking. So here I've got just a few more items that I want to mention. So right here, this is a small 18th century candle box style lantern. So you can see it's tin plate, opens up like this, place for a candle, it can swing, you can set it up like that. There's some room for some additional tinder or candles. And this is nice to have when you want a little more consistent light than a campfire. It's great for when you need to make gear repairs around camp after the sun's gone down. Uh, speaking of repairs, this is my repair kit here. Got an awl, some thread, some things for uh, patching, things like that. And then here, this isn't necessary by any means, but this is a portable Nine Man's Morris or Merrill set, and that's a lot of fun to have around camp. So I want to thank you for spending some time with me today and looking through my gear. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments. Any suggestions, tips, anything like that, I'd be happy to take a look at them. Go ahead and drop those in too. Now the best way to learn is to go out there and get in the woods. Be safe, but don't wait until you have the perfect kit. The best way to figure out what will work best for you is to go out and try it. So thank you again. Y'all have a good day.